Last week we began talking about uh, transition, transitions in pursuit of Christ, the transitions, the journeys you go through, and we are looking at uh, David, trying to appreciate the journeys of David, and I want to wrap it up today, I just need to do two sessions of this, and today we'll look at the journey of Elisha, Elijah and Elisha, particularly looking at what happened as Elisha pursues Elijah. Remember, our journey, spiritual journey, is in pursuit of Christ, isn't it? Now, wholesome maturity, I must begin there reminding us, wholesome maturity in the economy of God is Christ-likeness. Let me, let me put this clear. Spiritual maturity is not praying for long hours. That's okay and that's good. Spiritual maturity is not memorizing verses of the Bible. That's good, that's okay. We're together. Spiritual maturity is not even reading your Bible every day without missing. No, that's okay. That's encouraged to be done. Spiritual maturity is more than all that. Spiritual maturity is conformity to Christ's likeness. Conformity to his image, to his likeness. In thought, in reason, in understanding, in every way. You are conforming to the image and the likeness of Christ, who is the image of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Christ is the image of God. Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15, it says, He that is talking of Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is the image of the invisible God. So God is invisible but if you see Christ, you have seen God. So in other words, the Son is the expression of the Father. A Son mirrors the Father. Amen? A Son mirrors? By the way, let me tell you this. Unless you come to Christ and you are fully you know, submitted to Him in new birth, you will have a lot of tendencies and characteristics of your father, biological father and biological mother, whether you like them or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I like the looks on your faces. You can believe. Yes, that's so. Just look at your behaviors and you see your father. Look at your behaviors, you'll see your mother. Ah. Uh -huh. And don't justify that. My anger is like that of my father. Eh, that's not so. You have to come to Christ where that is dealt with. Am I saying that we, do, we, we should not? No, no, no. I'm not saying that. Of course, he is your father. He is your mother. You'll have the good in him. The good in her. We should carry on, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Carry the good in him. Carry the good in her. That's okay. But that which is not consistent with the kingdom, that which is not consistent with the word, you should get over it in Christ. So Christ, the image of the invisible God, the Son mirrors the Father. It's repeated again in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and verse number 1 to 4. God at various times and various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now, follow the language. God spoke to who? To the fathers. Then he spoke by who? By the prophets in these last days sorry as in these last days spoken to us by his son spoken to who to us you and i initially spoke to fathers now he has spoken to us by who by his son praise the name of the living god so if you study christ 
you will hear what the Father is saying to you. As in this last day spoken to us by his son, who has appointed whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. See that language? Not the world, the worlds. Or being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, only he had by himself but our sins sat down at the right hand of the, of the majesty on high, having become so much far better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And you can see therefore that he is the brightness. The Son is the brightness of the glory of the Father. The Son is the express image of the person of the Father. So when you conform to Christ, the Son of the living God, you're becoming like the Father. Amen? Amen. Maturity is conformity. Wholesome. That's what I wanted to capture. Wholesome maturity is conformity to the Son of the living God. Wholesome maturity in the economy of God is conformity to Christ. One of the greatest signs of maturity is the ability to make decisions in a manner that is consistent with the word of God, irrespective of the environment. You are able to make a decision and that decision is consistent with the will of God, irrespective of the what? The environment. You remember Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and there he's praying and he says, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Yeah, if it's possible, take the cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How many of you remember Peter, who is a fisherman by experience? He has been fishing the whole night. Jesus comes in the morning and tells him, Throw the net in there on the right side. But he's been fishing the whole night and caught nothing. However, he decides to obey the word of the Lord, make a decision that agrees, that conforms, that is consistent with the word of God. That is a sign of maturity. Amen. Amen. Young ladies, you don't choose a man who will marry you based on his pocket, based on his income, based on this. You, you must make that decision based on the word of God. What is God's will? What would God want for me? Make a decision that is consistent with the word of God. Young, young man, you don't look for a young lady to marry based on her color and curves. No. These are not matters of how cavacious one is or what color one is. These are matters of the word of God. What is God's desire for me? What is God's will? Make that decision in a manner that is consistent with the word of God. Amen? Amen. Another thing I need to show as a sign of maturity here. Another key point to maturity in a son, a son of God, is the ability to follow in genuine submission. Another sign of maturity. That's very key pointer to maturity. You want to see how mature you are or how mature one is. The key pointer is the ability to follow in genuine submission. All right? This is the ability to discern or recognize delegated authority, invite that authority, receive that authority, and support that authority. Design, invite, receive and support authority it is the ability to accept authority and to serve under authority the ability to accept i ought to be i should be led it is god's order for me to be led we all want to lead but not to be led it is the ability to accept authority and serve under authority with diligence and excellence without coercion you're not serving because you're forced. You're serving because you are submitted. It's willingness. That's how Jesus served. The Bible says in Judges 5.2, when leaders lead and people follow willingly, praise the Lord. Amen. I find that a very interesting verse. Is it there? All right, Judges 5.2. When the leaders lead, and then what happens? And the people willingly offer themselves that willingly following what happens praise the lord you cannot explain the outcome you cannot explain the fulfillment you cannot explain the joy the result is supernatural you can only praise the lord bless the lord bless the lord 
That's a powerful language there. Look at Jesus. I want to share a very interesting one. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Just before we follow, look at Eli uh, Elisha and Elijah. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. But the son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. Read verse number 9. Amen. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. The word lawlessness is anomaya. Anomaya in Greek. That, that anomaya says it talk, uh, is illegality. Means illegality. Contempt or violation of authority or of law. It's contempt or violation of the law. So you have hated illegality you have hated contempt for the law you have hated the transgression of the law it is also independence when you are free from authority illegality Jesus Christ when he was coming to begin his ministry, he did not begin from point of illegality. Are you together? He hated illegality. Lawlessness. The other word is there is lawlessness. He hated illegality. In some versions will use the word iniquity. Okay? Iniquity. That word iniquity is lawlessness. Look at what happens when Jesus begins. Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3, 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And Jesus tried, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? What would you do if Jesus came to you to be baptized? You tell him, eh, Jesus, Jesus, we don't do this. You are Jesus. <laughs> I don't do things that way. Jesus said, eh, eh. Jesus answers it to him, permit it to be so now. Now. I'll tell you why now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all. Yes. Remember he has loved righteousness, which has to do with order. Are we together? Which has to do with compliance to divine design. By the way, righteousness is compliance to divine design. Everybody say compliance, compliance. to divine design. That's what righteousness is. Righteousness is not staying like this. Righteousness is not refusing to greet people. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. Talk to me. Yes. Yeah. Righteousness is not refusing to watch a, mob, a movie with your children. No, no, no. Refusing to watch a movie with your children is called foolishness. They're very close. They can be confused. Foolishness. Righteousness. You see? Yeah. <laughs> It's foolishness, not righteousness. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. Play with your children. Enjoy time with them. Sit and watch movies with them. If you don't watch with them, the next thing, what they will watch, the day you discover, yeah. oh, unto you, you will be shocked. I would rather you watch with them, then you show them what you can watch and what you should not watch. Isn't it? Fulfill all righteousness, compliance to divine design. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well. Those words were never uttered by the Father, throughout the 30 years of existence of Jesus. Until the day Jesus comes, before he begins his ministry as a savior, he submits to the existing spiritual authority. Now, I did not say religious authority. I said spiritual authority. The God-ordained spiritual authority. Not every religious authority has spiritual authority. 
So he submits to the delegate God ordained spiritual authority. Suffer it to be so when? Because as at now you are the one in authority. Not me. Oh praise God. I know you know that I am he. Because you got a word from the father that when Adam comes and settles on me, then I am he. So I know you know I am he. But I've not yet been released to function. Now you are going in authority. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. I'm not yet in authority, John. Ah, oh, come on now. Yeah. Let it be so when? No. Because you're the one in authority now. Yeah. If we miss this now, we will not fulfill the righteousness. For us to fulfill the righteousness, in other words, for us to comply with the divine design, it must happen when? When he comes up, the father speaks. Up to this point, the word of the father is with John. The mantle is with John. The moment Jesus submits to John, and John baptizes Jesus, and Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, and the father speaks. This is my son. And he says, in whom I am well pleased. Why? He has loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. He is not independent. He recognizes authority. Oh, praise God. He is my son. And he is able to design my authority in another and submit. I am pleased with this son. Oh, glory to God. Amen. So when Jesus began his ministry, he lived his life and served under authority. You can see he begins from a place of submission. You see that? That's how Jesus began. But how do we begin? We begin from a point of self-exhortation. I feel so anointed. I can do ministry. Jesus did, Jesus did not feel anointed. He was the anointing. Come and talk to me, somebody. Jesus was the anointing itself. So he didn't feel anointed. He was the anointing. Christ, Messiah, Christ. Christos, meaning anointed one. Jesus did not have wisdom. He is the wisdom itself. He didn't have knowledge. He is the knowledge itself. So here is the anointing itself, embodied in the Son. Wisdom, light, truth, come on now. Hope, glory, grace, all anointing, all authority, God in a person. Come on now, talk to me. But he knows God's modus operandi. He knows how God operates. You've got to be under authority. You cannot begin without submission to authority. He simply knows you have to be sent by one who is in authority. That's why John was not born in the bush. He had to be born by Zechariah at the time when Zechariah was a priest in charge. Oh, come on now. So that he is born when the father is in authority. Therefore, he is already under one in authority. Then he can have authority to function. And then have authority to release the savior. To function in authority. Now, that's what maturity is. The ability to design authority. And submit and follow. Jesus is literally begging John to lead him. No, no, John, lead me. Tell me where to get in the water at which point. I'm under, I'm under your authority, John. Let it do it now. John, said, John says, no, 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 no. You are the son. He said, I, I'm the son of God, yes. But we must fulfill righteousness. We must comply to divine design. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. Oh, yes. He says, so, so you show me where do you want to stand. Which point? Here, there, where? Jesus will get in, in that river, Jordan, at the point where John says, and when he gets in the water, he will stay in that water for as long as John wants. Oh, yes. Fully in the authority. As a son of God, you must learn to design to be under authority. Amen? Amen? You can follow Jesus. He lived his life and served and functioned under authority. The son can do nothing. What I see is what I, I do. What I hear is what I say. Did you see Jesus saying those words? Yes. Because he's under 
authority. Maturity precedes inheritance. Remember we are talking about pursuing Christ. The transitions we make as we pursue Christ. As we mature towards him. Now we are, we are considering the example of Elisha. But before I get to that practical part of it, I want to say these thoughts. Maturity precedes inheritance. We're together. You cannot inherit without maturity. Number 30 in the Bible is a picture of maturity. 30 is a symbol, a picture of maturity. Jesus could not begin his ministry until he was 30 years. Maturity. He had to mature. You remember God telling Abraham that the children of Israel will be in a foreign country for 400 years. And then they left Egypt after how many years? 430 years. The time came for them to leave 400 years, but they were not yet mature. It took another time, 30 years, when they were mature. In other words, they left when they were mature enough to leave. Some of us, our time has come, but we are not ready yet. Not mature yet. We've got to wait for the 30. Galatians 4, 1, 2 says what? Galatians 4, 1, 2, now I say that the heir, as long as is a child, does not differ from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until they are appointed, the time appointed by them. What time is that? Maturity. Until the father says, when he gets to this age, then you'll give him this inheritance. It's the age of maturity. Listen to me. There are things you will see, but not access, depending on your level of maturity. I know we like the preaching. If you can see it, you're going to have it. I come today to you with a different doctrine. There are things you will see, but not access depending on your level of maturity. The son, Galatians 4, the son can see what the father left, but he cannot access it because the time appointed has not yet come. You've got to mature up, grow up to inherit. Amen? Amen. The journey of maturity is progressing. The journey of maturity is progressing. Progressing. And this is what we are looking at today as we consider Elisha. It's a progressive journey. You keep following and you follow under a leader. A leader that God has called and invested his grace in them to represent him in your life and to bring you to the place that God is calling you to be. This is what Moses was to Joshua. This is what Elijah was to Elisha. This is what the prophets were to the kings. This is what Jesus was to the apostles. This is what Paul was to Timothy. It is what Paul was to Titus. It is what Paul was to many others. This is God's way of doing things. You've got to learn to follow to come to the place where God is calling you. Amen? Yes. Second Kings, chapter 2, verse 1 to 13, you could read the story of consider I mean of Elijah and Elisha. Time fails me to read the whole of that portion of scripture, but I'll go off it as we go along. But you can read it in your time. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Read all the way to verse 25 and see <clears throat> what is going on there. Now, God will always raise a leader, whether you want to call him a father, a spiritual leader, or a pastor, whatever you want to call it, it's your own uh, choice. But God will always raise a leader to walk with you through different stages of life to maturity. Okay? God raises a leader to walk with you in different stages, through different stages in your journey to maturity. Please remember, brothers and sisters, you don't choose the leader. It is God who chooses. You design. God chooses, you design. Everyone say after me, God chooses, God chooses. I, design. I design. Say the choice is God's. Designment is my responsibility. 
very important very important so to design so god chooses elisha to follow elijah he tells elijah go and anoint elisha to follow you to take up after you what you'll do is he goes on and throws his mantle to elisha and elisha leaves everything elisha was a farmer Elijah was a what? A Can I tell you this? God does not work with lazy people. Please help me tell your neighbor. The preacher said, God does not work with lazy people. I know we are in a holiday session. Children are home now for how many months? Two months or so? Yes. It is immoral for you as parents to let your children stay at home doing yes. nothing. It is immoral. Immoral is spelled as I-M-M-O-R-A-L. Immoral. Everybody will say immoral. immoral. Yeah. You got to make sure they do something. Let them work. Bible says, if you don't work, you don't eat. eat. I can't pay for your school fees, give you money to eat, pay for your rent, and you just sleep. Do nothing. Mm -hmm. Not in my house. Mm -hmm. No. Eat, you eat my food, work in my house. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. Parents, you must teach your children to work. Yes. Let them know they must work. Yeah. Let God find them doing Some something. something. Any child who is five years and above must begin to do something. Any human being who is more than 13 years and above and does nothing is lazy and must not be entertained. Let them wash the dishes. Let them wipe the house. Let them do something. Let me say this as we begin to wrap up on this. Let me say this. Beloved. God does not give you what you ask for. He gives you what you can handle. That's a phrase that was quoted from a book written by the late Dr. Miles Munro. I so agree with that. God does not give you what you ask for. He gives you what you can handle. So you must come to that place, friends and brothers and sisters, that you have a sense of maturity within you, that you are responsible enough to do what you should do. Let me also say this. One of the expressions of maturity is the ability to follow. A son who has the ability to follow is an expression of responsibility. Listen, it takes a responsible man to follow. Telling the truth. One who has taken responsibility over their own life. You're not able to follow if you have not taken responsibility of your own life. If you see a man who has a problem following authority, a person who has a problem in following authority, that person has not assumed responsibility over their own life. They are simply irresponsible. So if you are going to get to where God wants you to be, you must be able to follow. To follow, you must be mature enough, isn't it? Express maturity. You must be responsible enough. That you are able to submit to that leader. That God has set over you. I want to conclude today by saying this. Allow me to go through Second Kings next week. Let me say this to us again. God appoints a man. God invests grace in that man. And God sets that man over you as his representative over your life, a leader over your life. And that man has the responsibility to lead you on to Christ. Amen. I must say this 
You are not that man's possession. God does not call a leader to own or to possess. Even when we talk about spiritual fathering, a spiritual father is not an owner. No leader owns anyone. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. It's what happens is when a leader tries to possess or to own people, they riot. Am I right? Yeah. So the work of the leader is to help you through the journeys of but towards maturity, the journeys of life towards maturity. Because there are journeys, there are stages. We'll be looking at them on Sunday as we look at the example of Elisha and Elijah. And see the journey that a son goes through with the father. Are you together? See the journey that a son goes through with the father. To the point of coming to inherit. For you to inherit that which God is calling you to. For you to inherit what the Lord has showed you. You must learn to follow. Amen? Amen. Let me say this as a wrap up. You don't know. You have seen we don't know where your inheritance is. You don't know where your inheritance is. That's why you must follow until you are brought to where the inheritance is. To that point that you know this is it. And no son can bring themselves, no child can bring themselves to maturity. No child can bring themselves to inheritance. Amen. This is God's way of doing things. To bring you to maturity, He places you under a leader, His chosen and anointed leader. I go back to what I was talking about parents and the rest. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, none of you chose your parents, but God placed you under those parents. You know why? To build you up, to lead you, and bring you to an inheritance. There's only one person who does not like their parent and admires other parents and wishes that all those other parents were their parent. Only one kind of a person. The immature child. Only a child does that. I mean, all of you agree with me when you are a child. You wished that other parent family was your family. Am I right? God knew where to put me. I needed a woman who was not going to raise a thief because God wanted in me the man I am today the preacher I am today. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't raise this. Yes. Whatever it takes, don't raise this. Those children are your hand, in your hands. They have a destiny. God has a purpose for them. Whatever it takes, make sure they become what God has called and ordained for them to be. Sometimes if it takes a, if it takes a fight, do it. Discipline, do it. Let them get there. Amen. Amen. God placed them under your custody for a purpose, for a reason. Just like he placed you. Some of you, you know, your fathers were so tough. But God knew if you were not born there. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. You have to be born there. Everyone say after me again. The choice is God's. Discernment is, is my responsibility. Of this matter, we shall discuss more. God bless you.